I'm going to start with a couple of slides to show you some background information that I think is important um, to get us back into the text that we're going to be looking at. So if we can show the first one, um, let me get to it here. John, both in his gospel as well as his epistle, brings us this duality. And this duality encompasses all the human experience. There is no in-between. Um, you are either in side A or you are in side B. And uh, that's it. Those are the only biblical alternatives. So we have God and we have Satan. We have Christ. We have the Antichrist, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan, church, world, righteousness, sin, Children of God, children of Satan, love, hate, light, dark, life, death, good, evil, truth, lie, lifestyle of obedience, lifestyle of lawlessness, produce fruit through abiding, produce evil through abiding, confess Jesus as the Christ, deny Jesus as the Christ. All of these themes are reflective of that text, of 218 through 310, and, and you need to have them stirred in the back of your mind to see that in the text as John, as John writes to his church. Um, you know, as an aside, it's hard to look outside the church, to look outside the doors or look Monday through Saturday in the world in which we live and see the right-hand side of that. But that's God's view. That's the biblical view of the world. And that's where we are challenged to exercise the left-hand side in the midst of the fallenness of the right-hand side. So let's go to the second slide. A second key theme or, or, or a key word that John uses is the Greek word is meno. It's translated abide in the ESV. And this shows you the use of that word in, throughout the Bible. So it's used 53 times total. Um, it's used 23 times just in 1 John. And it's used uh, 14 times in the Gospel of John. In the text that we're looking at today, it's used seven times. Obviously, it's a big deal to John, and we're going to probe what that means. Um, we'll, we'll go back and look a little bit at John 15, but it's key to this whole uh, supernatural life that John is describing in the, in the contrast of the heresies that he is confronting. Um, so that's good for the slides for now. Um, one thing when we think about abiding, when we think about this dualistic uh, worldview, we always in the West, first and foremost, think about it as, okay, this is Mike and God, or Mike and Jesus, or Mike versus the world, and, and that's just how we're learned. We, we're trained that way, everything in this culture drives us that way, not so in other cultures, but certainly in ours, and I want us to, in, uh, to, to get past that. And look at it in addition to yourself, look at it as heritage. So for instance, abiding, how does Mike abide? Well, how does heritage abide? How does Mike help heritage abide? Okay, John, when we look at this text and, and throughout the epistle, the pronouns are all plural. They're not singular. Right? So he's talking to a church, and it's, it's very much focused on the local church. And this is our local church. It's not Paul's local church. It's not Mike's local church. It's our local church. And the same spirit that John's going to talk about that saved that church that he was writing to, the churches he was writing to, is present here among us. Okay? And then lastly, I want to remind us what, what the heresies were. So there, there's five primary ones I want to mention. Number one, they do not believe, the heretics did not believe in Jesus as the incarnate, anointed Son of God. There's a lot of variations on what they believed, but we won't get into that. Secondly, um, 
they believed material things were evil and spiritual things were good. So that's a, that's a Greek philosophy thing, but as a, as a corollary of that, they also believed they didn't sin. They were sinless because the spirit wasn't engaged in the sin that the physical was, so they weren't sinning. It's an interesting logic. Four, they believed that there was a select group among them that had been given special revelation beyond the apostolic teaching, beyond the Holy Spirit, beyond everything. They had the keys, so to speak, to this supernatural life. And then lastly, they were intentionally trying to lead astray God's people. So in these churches, it wasn't just that they were talking about different theology. They were intentional. They were trying to lead the sheep astray from the shepherd. All right. So with that, um, we're going to dive into this. Uh, how much time do I have? How much? Six more minutes. Six more minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the fireworks. All right. Um, well, I will, I will not read the whole thing first. We're just going to go through it in sections, and I'll maybe, I think it'll all still come together for you. So let's look at the first couple of verses. Verse 18. Children. And children is an affectionate term. Um, John is an older elder at this point, and he views these people as his sheep. He is a shepherd, and he's a pastor, and it's coming from a pastoral heart. He says, it is the last hour, and as you have heard this, that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is this, the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So, we'll stop there. First, I want to talk about the last hour. So this is a reference to the eschaton, the end times. And those churches were as familiar um, in some ways as we are about the Antichrist being associated with the return of Christ and the end times. And that was one of the signs, so to speak, that Jesus would come again. John, uh, who was also, I believe, the author of Revelation, um, declares, we know that Antichrist is coming, so this is the end time. But then he says, so now there's proof. Many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. So he's using these secessionists, which means they seceded or they left the church, the ones that are the heretics, left the church um, those he's declaring as Antichrist. And he's going to, I don't want to uh, jump the gun, so he's going to define what that is a little bit later. So we'll leave the definition here for a moment. But he is defining these, these heretics as Antichrists. And the word Antichrist is exactly what it sounds like it should be. Christ is in the Greek Christos, and anti is against or uh, false Christ. So it's exactly what it sounds like it should be. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Um, the way John describes this, it's an act of God that moves these heretics out from among us. So they were in, there was wolves, so to speak, in, in the flock, um, but they coalesced into a, into a group, and God, by His divine protection through His Holy Spirit of His flock, moved them out. They left the church, and He did that for two reasons. One was to protect His flock from false teaching, but secondly, to prove to His flock that they were antichrists. They were not of Christ. They were not therefore eligible to be in his church. So I want us to, to take heart and to take courage to know that that same spirit 
is still here at Heritage and still protecting us and still driving out evil and antichrists and evil ideas from us to protect us as well as to encourage and enrich us. Verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. I'm going to go back to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16. And this is where, this is the uh, upper room discourse. This is the night Jesus was betrayed. He's with the disciples. And he introduces the concept of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to pick up in chapter 16 and verse 7. And, and just listen to the, the uh, things that Jesus says versus what John says. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, if it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because though they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. And then concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but they can't, you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And now in verse 20, John says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. So, 1 John 2, chapter, verse 20 is actually a fulfillment of Jesus' words in John 16. So what does anointing mean here? Anointing uh, is uh, a, a, a term that was used throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, for instance, um, many of us think of Samuel anointing King David, right? So what did he use to anoint him? Oil. The word anoint actually literally means smear. Um, but it has come to be known really as what the, what the uh, medium is. So in this, in this case, it was oil, and, and Samuel didn't smear it so much as he poured it over his head. But for our case, it all began with, with Jesus. When he was baptized, um, what happened? The dove came down in the form, or the spirit came down in the form of the dove, and anointed him, right? And, and God spoke, this is my son. So he was anointed. This time the median was the Holy Spirit. That started a new way of being anointed. You and I, those in Christ, have been anointed that same way. The Holy Spirit himself has anointed us, dwells within us. We have been smeared, if you will, with the divine. Verse 21, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. So again, going back to, to John, what was one of the things that J the Holy Spirit was going to do? It was going to reveal truth, right? Here's the uh, litmus test for an antichrist. Verse 22, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So those words sound very familiar to, to Jesus, right? Uh, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There is this uh, very intimate uh, relationship between the Father and the Son. And so if you do not acknowledge Jesus, you have not acknowledged the Father. And 
it's, it's important to understand truth um, as it's talked about in the Gospel of John and in the Epistle of John and really throughout the New Testament. Truth for us is at face value, it's, it's facts, right? So we think of facts about history. We think of facts about law or whatever, whatever it is. But biblically, it's deeper than that. It is facts, it is knowledge, but it's also relationship. So we are in actual relationship with the truth, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14. And, and an example of this, the difference, the nuance of it is, say you have a, a really good friend, and that friend, uh, you, hear, you hear some disparaging words uh, or testimony about that person. So gossip, right? And your reaction is going to be dependent on how you understand that person, that person's character, those person's values, the history that that person has exhibited towards you, correct? And so, yeah, you know the bio of that person, you know the facts, but you have a deeper intimate knowledge of that person. So you can either agree or disagree and make a much more discerning evaluation of what that new testimony is based on how you already knew that person. Does that make sense? It's the same with Jesus, right? He is the truth. The more we know him, and not facts necessarily, facts are important, but it's the relational part that, that John's driving at here. It's that relationship that allows us better discernment, that allows us deeper sensitivity to truth versus false, versus lies, versus liars, okay? Um, verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. So John, in this whole from 18 through 27, is explaining what's happened spiritually, um, why these heret heretics left, where they're at in the eschaton, the timetable, um, and, and identified three specific tools that we have as Christians today to combat heresy and that they used to combat heresy. The first, starting in 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. One of the things that I mentioned at the start that the uh, heretics uh, discounted was the apostolic teaching. And so we're just going to call that the Word or the Bible, but it's really what all of the apostles saw, they were eyewitnesses to, and they were the ones that wrote the New Testament. So they are what we depend on, that eyewitness account. Um, and John spent a very lot, a lot of time in the very first few verses of, of the epistle to, to hammer home the importance of that. Well, he's using it here. And so they denied basically the apostolic witness. Secondly, the second tool is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the third tool really is, is for us to abide. He, he closes it up, but as his anointing teaches you, that's the Holy Spirit revealing truth, teaching you about everything and is true, and is no lie, again, contra the heretics, just as it was taught you by me, basically, the apostle, abide in him, Jesus. Does that make sense? So he's kind of walked them through a theological expl explanation of what's, what's happening and where God's at in it. And he now is going to shift gears a little bit and uh, we'll, the next section we're going to take a look at really is 
uh, verses 28 through the third verse of chapter 3. And I'll just, uh, I'll read the first couple verses. Verse 28, and now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So John is anticipating uh, a little bit of fear. He's anticipating his sheep are scared. They don't know what's going on. There's, he's trying to be sensitive and pastoral to that. And he produces this amazing promise. And if you're like me, uh, when I, I think anybody that has declared Jesus as Lord has thought and, and has dreamed about what would they would do or when they see Jesus, that event, right? And for me, and I think like most of us, there's, there's kind of a mixed emotion. There's excitement, there's awe, there's wonder, but then there's fear, there's shame. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of this. And what he says is amazing, and he, he says it to his, his flock that has just been through uh, this, this wretched separation, um, and, and I want to piece it together for you. Uh, if we abide in him, or, or I'm sorry, abide in him so that, so this is the purpose then, when he appears, when Jesus comes again, we may not, or we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Now, those of you that know your Bible really well, flashback to Genesis 2, and the very end of that chapter, we have Adam and Eve standing naked in the garden without shame before the Lord, before God. When Jesus comes again, what John is saying is we will be without shame. So the falseness that I'm thinking of when I see Jesus will be gone. Why? Well, he says in 29, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So he plants uh, this idea of being born of Jesus and that we will be confident through the righteousness that we do because we abide in him. Does that make sense? And again, going back to John 15, this righteousness is the fruit of abiding in uh, Jesus. Let me just read that real quick. So John 15... It's somewhere in here. Starting at verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. So again, this is, in a sense, uh, the fulfillment of what Jesus is talking about. And through this maturation process, 
through the abiding, we call it sanctification, we become more Christ-like. And at some point, which we'll read here just in this next little paracope, um, we become uh, we become perfect, in a sense. Let me start with uh, the beginning of chapter 3. Jesus, or John has just said, uh, the righteousness has been born of him, and it almost excites him. It, it kind of causes him to pause and, and kind of take a rabbit trail and um, praise God. And he says this, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because he, we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So again, putting yourselves in the mindset of the the churches that he's talking to, they're wondering about sin, they're wondering about their salvation, they're wondering about um, why all of this has happened to them. And John is moved by the Spirit to speak of this adoption. And we, each one of us here at home, wherever you're at, that call on the name of Jesus as Lord are right now adopted. We have made the transition from the right to the left. We are no longer under Satan's rule. We are now under God's rule. And as we will read here in a little bit, we actually have divine seed that God has planted in us. We are His. He has marked us as His. And He loves us beyond our understanding, then is translated lavishly loves us. And it's described here when Jesus comes, when he appears, or I'm sorry, what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Right now, we each have uh, a vision of Jesus that's developed by our faith in the Bible, right? It's our mind's eye to, to see what Jesus looks like. The, the, the coming of the Lord will be real. It'll be physical. Our physical eyes will see him. Our physical hands will touch him. We will physically hear his voice. And we will see him glorified. And we will see him resurrected and we will be made like him. And it's at that point that we become perfected. It's at that point we overcome sin. It's at that point we truly are his brother and his sister. And that's the goal, right? And, and John ends this, everyone who thus hopes in him, hopes in that moment, hopes in that person, purifies himself as he is pure. So. So we purify ourselves, we purify heritage as Jesus is pure. We call it being made into his image. Um, you know, I'll just leave it for there. Um, so that's our future. That's the goal. That's, that's the end game, so to speak. In the meantime, we live in a sinful and fallen world. And we have sin to deal with. And sin is not of God. Sin is against God and sin is actually of Satan. How do we as Christians, as fallen sinners, deal with that? And so this next section, um, 4 through 10, deals with that. And it, it's uh, a little bit challenging to us. Uh, and I want to soften it a little bit, but I want to I leave it as challenging because all of us need to learn to hate sin. And we need to live in the tension of being a sinner, but loving righteousness and, and leaning into the righteousness. So let me read this, and then we'll talk about uh, 
how to, how to absorb it. Verse 4 of chapter 3, everyone who practices, I'm sorry, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So how do we, how do we deal with that? Uh, if you're like me, uh, I, I still sin. So, so how do you deal with verse 9? No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Well, I want to I give us three reasons, um, three arguments, why we should consider this practice of sinning more habitual sin. And I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with the elders because uh, I haven't really talked to them. Uh, specifically about this, but I'm pretty confident they would agree. This is kind of Heritage's position on, on how, how we view this. Um, there's, a, there's a tension, there's a contradiction, if you will, from our perspective. So let, let me read from chapter 1 of John, starting at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. And then 3.9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So how do we reconcile those things? Well, as I said, there's three arguments. The first is grammatical. The ESV, which is what I'm reading for, the, translates the word poeo um, into practices, and it is a uh, indicative active verb, uh, which means nothing to probably you, but what it means is it's a continual practice. It's continuing action. So it's not a one-time thing, it's an ongoing thing. And in this case, uh, the nuances means continual or habitual sinning. Argument two is contextual. Uh, in in the, the epistle as a whole, John is attacking heretics that claim to have no sin and deny Jesus as the God-man and the anointed one. Through this epistle, and permeating our text today is the word abide or meno. We are to abide in Christ in a deep relational bond between Jesus, myself, between Jesus, and you, between Jesus and heritage. There is a supernatural depth to that bond. It also implies fruit, as we talked about in John 15. If we are abiding, then that fruit will occur. It will be made, not by us, but by the vine itself. Abiding, in a sense, is, is connecting, and if we are not abiding, we are disconnected from the Father. And then argument three really is theological. Um, Jesus came and he defeated Satan. He conquered the ruler of this world, and established his kingdom as having authority. Now, his kingdom is still um, 
subversive, if you will. Think of the, the, the flower and the... Um, uh, what's it? Yeast. Uh, parable, sorry. I don't bake. Uh, so there's a little yeast, there's us, and then there's a whole lot of flour. And, and we work through, in kind of a hidden way, that the kingdom lives out through us and through heritage. Um, the end game of that is uh, the freedom that we have. And it's interesting that, that Paul and, and his wife came to that from Galatians 5. But we, uh, as humanity, with the, with the conquering of Jesus, of Satan on the cross and resurrection, have the freedom to respond to the call of the gospel. So now we have an alternative. Before Christ, we didn't have an alternative. There was only one worldview. There was only one experience for the humanity. Now, as pagans, as Gentiles, we have two paths. And we can convert, if you will, from the, the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of Jesus if we acknowledge Jesus and if we believe in the teachings. So as we grow, uh, if we accept that and as we grow in that life, we become adopted. The divine seed is itself deposited in us. And in short, we become more Christ-like. We become more Christ-like as individuals, and we become more Christ-like in community as the church of heritage. So for those three reasons, um, I think it's, it's a good exegetical um, interpretation to see chapter 3 different than chapter 1 as far as the sinning that is taking place. And the bottom line is... Uh, I think chapter 3 is better interpreted as habitual sin. Some of us here probably fall into that camp right now. Some of us are practicing habitual sin, knowingly or unknowingly. Others of us, all of us, are in camp 1, right, in chapter 1. We have all sinned. To deny so is, is heretical. One other note in chapter 1... If you note John, he's using the pronoun we, so he's associating himself with those in chapter 1. Not so in chapter 3. He doesn't associate himself with those. So, kind of to contextualize, I will ask myself a bunch of questions and answer them for you. Do I sin? Yes. Have I stopped specific habitual sins in my life? Yes. Am I more Christ-like today than yesterday? Yes. Will I sin tomorrow? Yes. Should my sinning continue to be reduced? Yes. When will I stop sinning? When Christ comes again. Do I produce the fruit of righteousness? Yes. This is what is called sanctification. This is what is called purification. And this, I guess, I'm thinking, I'm hoping, I'm praying, this is where most of us are. In this tension between seeing ourselves still sinning, having the Spirit reveal to us new ways that we sin that we didn't even know about, but continuing to conquer them, continuing to grow in our Christ-likeness. Again, personally as well as, as a church locally. Let us not minimize, however, the critical message John is making. I find it helpful to look at the positive goal versus what to avoid. He's ended it with, this is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. But the reciprocal of those is also true. Focus on what we are striving for versus our current condition. We are striving for purity. We are striving for righteousness. We are striving for Christ's likeness. Yes, we stumble. Yes, we fall. Yes, we see sin in ourselves in the mirror. And we see sin in our brothers and sisters. But let us not forget that we have chrisma, right? Chrisma. We have the anointing. We have the Holy Spirit, 
We have the apostolic teaching. We have the word. And we are abiding in Christ. And then from this last section, we add the seed of God himself. We are divinely adopted. And you don't unadopt. We have an adopted daughter. You don't unadopt. God's never going to unadopt us. He can't. As a teleological community, meaning we are working towards a goal, the eschatology goal, um, let us at Heritage press on to achieve these goals. And if we do, John guarantees we will practice righteousness and love our brothers. Let us at Heritage be known for this in this valley. Let us be known for striving for purity, for exhorting each other to good works and holy living. Let us offer grace and love in truth to each other. And when we do sin, let us be more Christ-like tomorrow than today. Let us be courageous. Let us not hide sin, but let us bring it to the light and let it be redeemed. All right. I had a couple more, and I kind of skipped through that one. So... Yeah, let's just go to the last one. So these are the things that I want you to kind of take away. One, develop, if you don't already have, what I'm calling theological lenses. It's similar to uh, what I started with in this duality that John brings. But these are things important for us to, to contextualize our experience, both in our lives as well as in this church. A, to understand the exclusive dual world realities. B, to understand how much God hates sin. He hated it so much he sent his only son. C, to understand sin and its destructive nature. D, to appreciate the work of Jesus, the anointed one. And then number two, to abide in the chrisma and the apostolic teaching of the gospel. Three, to abide in Jesus and the Father. Four, to exercise the production of righteous acts as naturally outworkings of your divine nature. See yourself as adopted sons and daughters. We are made as humans and we will reflect our Father's character. And we will reflect traits of our Father, whether we want to or not. We have been transferred. Our fathers have been transferred, right? We are taken out from being a, uh, our Father being Satan to our Father being God. And we will, as time goes on, and as, as we have this abiding relationship with Him, be transformed by that. Five, rest in the assurance of divine nature. You already are living the eternal life. I know that's hard to grasp, but you're already living in eternity. Lean into abiding. God has actually adopted you as you sit here today. He lavishly showers his children with love. He protects you. Six, believe in the person and work of Jesus, not in your emotions and feelings, not in your understanding of theology, not in your ability to quote scripture or how much you attend church. It's the person and the work of the anointed one that you need to put your faith in. Seven, develop the maturity to rest in the tension of committing a sin, but yearning for perfect righteousness. Eight, holiness is not attained by fear, but by faith and abiding in Christ. Oh, you guys are on different numbers. <laughs> cool. All right. Let me close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this teaching. We thank you for John and his words, and more importantly, for the realities which they represent. And help us to comprehend, both personally and corporately, um, how to live these out, how to impact the, the fallen world that we interact with through these teachings and um, grow in our purity, 
diminish our sinfulness, increase our righteousness, so that we may love more abundantly and more perfectly. In Jesus' name, amen.